don't care. Probably won't talk much. Cool, because we're live now. Gotta double check, make sure. It's, sorry, it's gonna be dark for a second. I'm just making sure it's running. Okay, it's running. Cool. Put it back to bright. <laughs> my my only light is my monitor. Ah. Okay. Uh So, last stream we were studied. Well, not my last one, but the last one in this playlist on this topic. We were doing sporties, sporties pilot shop, studying for the written exam, and we both passed. Oh, who joined? Jeffrey. Jeffrey! I'm live streaming right now, just so you're aware. So, I've got my strawberry lemonade or raspberry lemonade. I forget what it is. I'm watching you. ASMR. How's that for ASMR? No, so we passed our exam passed our exams and now it's time for this book right here this is this is the book that I must know all of so we're gonna start chapters one two and three tonight <clears throat> chapter one section a privileges and limitations Question one, what are the eligibility requirements for a commercial pilot airplane certificate? Carly, you should know these. How old do you have to be? 18. 18. You have to be able to read, speak, write, and understand the English language. You must hold at least a private pilot certificate. And what medical must you hold, Carla? Second class. No, third class. You have to hold at least a current third class medical certificate to be eligible. Second class to actually to exercise the privileges of your commercial. Yeah, exercise privileges. Yes. Receive the required ground and flight training endorsements, and pass the required knowledge and practical tests. Plus, you have to meet the aeronautical experience requirements. Uh okay. What are the aeronautical experience requirements? Here we go. A person who applies for a commercial pilot certificate within an airplane category and a single engine class rating must log at least 250 hours of flight time as a pilot that consists of at least 100 hours in powered aircraft, 50 hours must be in airplanes, 100 hours of pilot and command flight time, which has to have 50 hours in airplanes and 50 hours of cross-country flights, 10 of which must be in airplanes, C, 20 hours of training on the areas listed in 61.127B1, which that includes at least 10 hours of instrument training. Five of the 10 hours of instrument training must be in a single-engine airplane. I think we got that one covered. Oh, okay. That's sad. You know you could say that out loud, right? Yeah, but you were reading, so I'm not going to... Oh, well, now I'm not reading. Just, All right. yeah... Well, this is my way of focusing. You have your own way of focusing. So go focus, and I'll focus, I and then we can watch anime. Okay. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Uh, Ten hours of training in complex turbine-powered or technically advanced aircraft or any combination thereof. Ten hours solo flight time in a single-engine airplane. Ten hours of flight time performing the duties of PIC in a single-engine airplane with authorized instructor on board that include... This is the part. This is the hard part right here. This is the um, one cross country flight of not less than 300 nautical miles total distance, which must include takeoffs and landings, uh, three points, and 250 nautical miles in a straight line, plus five hours in night VFR conditions with 10 takeoffs and 10 landings at an airport with an operating control tower. Yeah. Exam tip. The evaluator may ask you to demonstrate that you're current and eligible to take the practical test. When preparing for your practical test, verify that you have the required ground and flight time experience that you're current. And don't forget to double check all of your endorsements. Make sure that all of your logbook columns are totaled and the page totals are carried forward. And that you have assigned each page and have verified that all the entries make sense. I'm going to do that. I have my logbook right here. So I need to do that at some point. So I'm going to leave this here so I don't forget it. 
Uh, I have one page that I haven't totaled yet. Explain the difference between your commercial pilot privileges and the operational authority required to conduct a flight for compensation or hire. The privileges and limitations conferred on pilots are separate and distinct from the operational authority required to conduct the flights. A person who holds an ATP certificate or a commercial pilot certificate may act as PIC of an aircraft operated for compensation or hire and may carry persons or property for compensation or hire. However, most of these commercial operations require the operator to hold a certificate under Part 119 authorizing such operations. Unless a, va a valid exception from the operational certification applies, in order to hold out as being able to transport persons or property for compensation or hire, a commercial pilot or ATP pilot must be operating in accordance with the air carrier certificate or operating certificate and issued under Part 119 of 14 CFR. Note. Even though a commercial pilot certificate allows a pilot to carry passengers or property for compensation or hire, does not allow them to act as an air carrier or commercial operator without first obtaining an air carrier or operating certificate. And basically the stuff that's not covered under Part 119 would be like photo missions, uh, crop dusting, uh, scenic tours, uh, survey work, and I don't remember. I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's it. Commercial operator is a person who, for compensation or hire, engages in the carriage by aircraft in air commerce of persons or property other than as an air carrier of a f or foreign air carrier under the authority of Part 375, where it is doubtful that an operation is for compensation or hire. The test applied on whether the carriage air by air is merely incidental to the person's other business or is in itself a major enterprise for profit. Question six. Would being both the pilot and provider of an aircraft to someone for compensation or hire require the pilot to be in possession of Part 119 operating certificate? Oh, my computer just did its, like, nighttime thing where it changes the color of the screen yellower. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to look at the answer. Hold on. If you provide the aircraft... Okay. So, if you're providing the aircraft and the pilot, I'm guessing that that would be, you can't. You can't do it. Generally, if you're being compensated for providing a service to another person and have operational control of the aircraft in which that service is provided, you are required to have been issued an operating certificate to conduct that operation under Part 135 or Part 121 or 125 if larger aircraft or more complex operations are involved. Find the term operational control. As defined in 14 CFR subsection 1.1, operational control with respect to a flight means the exercise of authority over initiating, conducting, or terminating a flight. Operational control involves three basic areas, flight crew, aircraft, and flight management. What is common carriage? Okay, common carriage is when you're holding out. That's what I'm saying, all right? I'm not, I'm not reading it yet. Common carriage is when you are holding out, which means like you're advertising. You're saying, hey, I can fly you for money. And you're carrying people that are paying you from place to place. Okay. Here we go. Common carriage refers to carriage passengers or cargo as a result of advertising the availability of the carriage to the public. A carrier becomes a common carrier when it holds itself out to the public or a segment of the public, as willing to furnish transportation within the limits of its facilities to any person who wants it. There are four elements in defining a common carrier. A is holding out for or willingness, right? That means like, hey, I'll do this for you. Uh, transport persons or property. All right. From place to place for compensation or hire. What actions by a pilot would constitute holding out? So holding out is accomplished by any means that communicates to the public that a transportation services I service is indiscriminately available to the members of that segment of the public that it is designed to attract. There is no specific rule or criteria as to how holding out is achieved. Instead, holding out is determined by assessing the available facts of a specified situation. Advertising in any form raises the question of holding out. So basically, if you advertise that you can carry people, if you're paying for advertisements, you are definitely holding out. <laughs> if you just say to your friend, like, Oh, you need to fly there? I could do that for you. Get in my plane. Pay for me. That's, like, very questionable because it's not, like, public. But you also did offer, and you're providing the plane. 
if your friend owns the plane and is like, ah, I need to go from here to here, and you're like, I can do that for you, that's like kind of on the line. But if they are like, hey, could you do this for me? Then it's good because that's part 91. I think. Just, what are examples of factors that the FAA would consider in determining whether an operator is holding out? They would consider whether an operator is using agents, agency, or salespeople, print publications, or the internet to advertise. Uh, websites, social media, apps, email, or personal solicitation, which would be like if you get the reputation of being like, hey, I can do this for you, right? If you have that reputation, then you are holding out. If you're just doing it for your friend, that's a little different. Um, are there commercial operations that the commercial pilot could conduct that do not require the issuance of a Part 119 certificate? All right, here we go. You do not need... A Part 119 certificate when conducting Ooh. student instruction, non-stop commercial air tours, ferry or training flights, crop dusting, seeding, spraying, or bird chasing, banner towing, that's the one I forgot before, uh, aerial photography or survey, firefighting, power line or pipeline patrol, carrying persons for the purpose of intentional parachute operations. Oh, that's the other one I forgot, parachutes. Um, emergency mail services or... Carrying carriage of candidates in elections, huh? That's an interesting one. So you can carry you can carry some politicians around. That's not common carriage. You don't need a certificate for that. Whack. Hmm. Determine if either of the following two scenarios are common carriage operations, and if so, why? Scenario number one. I'm a local business person and require a package to be flown to a distant destination ASAP. I'll pay you to fly my airplane to deliver this package. Alright, I would say that is not common carriage because someone is paying you, right, but they are offering it to you. You didn't offer it to them. You're not holding out. It's just this one situation and it's their airplane. So I'm guessing that is not holding out. Uh, scenario two is a local business person and require a package to be flown to a distant destination ASAP. Um, you reply that you could do the job for free. You line up a local rental aircraft you're checked out in and deliver the package. What? The answer is scenario two would be considered common carriage because you are holding out by indicating a general willingness to all customers with whom contact is made to transport persons or property. No, nah, that doesn't make any sense. Some of these rules are kind of dumb. That does make no that does not make sense at all. Because oh, for a fee. See, I read that wrong. You see, if you said for f I read it as for free. That's why I was so confused. <laughs> no, no, no. For a fee. Ah, you see, that's a lot different than for free. Uh-huh, so for a fee. Yeah, that's definitely common carriage. Yeah, okay. That makes way more sense. <laughs> uh, the three types of operations that require Part 19 certificates are direct air carriers, U.S. commercial operators, and operations with common carriage is not involved, but if you have more than 20 passengers or maximum payload capacity is more than 6,000 pounds. All right. Um... The two basic types of certificates are air carrier and operation, uh, operating certificate. Four types of commercial operations that do not require common carriage would be non-common carriage operations where they're transported without compensation or hire, uh, and operations not involving the transportation of persons or cargo, and private carriage. Um... There is compensation and hire for non-common carriage and private carriage. However, they are not common carriage because, well, non-common carriage, you're not holding out. And private carriage is you're working for somebody privately. All right, non-common carriage and private carriage. So non-common carriage, you're not holding out. Uh, you do... 
need an operational certificate, part 125 or 135, depending on seating or payload capacity. Private carriage is um, a limited number of contracts that you can do it for. And it's 125 or 135, depending on aircraft and all that junk. Man, I'm only on chapter one. This is this is going to take a little while. I'm already on question 17, though. Several types of non-common carriage. Uh, like part 91. Part F is turbine-powered multi-engine. Okay, so if you're carrying the operator... Okay, if flight's conducted by the operator of the aircraft for your own personal transportation... Or transportation of guests is okay. Carriage of company officials, employees, and guests with joint ownership is okay. Or uh, time sharing. Lemonade is good. Very good lemonade. Uh, property except mail that's for business a, a group with common purpose and you don't charge or fractional ownership alright a lease involving an aircraft is sometimes referred to as a wet lease or a dry lease I know this one a wet lease includes at least one crew member and requires that the the lease the person leasing or entity leasing that's providing the crew has an operational certificate uh, a dry lease a dry lease you do not require an operational certificate because it's just the airplane the person who is the lessee the lessee the person leasing it from the person leasing uh, would require the operational certificate. A uh, common form of dry lease would be rental agreements. Be like, if you go to your flight school and you're like, hey, can I rent this airplane? And, uh, it's, you're, you're renting it yourself. Then you don't have a passenger, you don't have a pilot as part of that. So you do not require an operational certificate. Um, that is why if you're flying with a flight instructor that you are paying, you can't like get out somewhere at a destination because that would be illegal. Because then that would be essentially the instructor flying you somewhere, which would require an operational certificate. It's important to understand the difference because uh, if you have a certificate, it has to be 121 or 135, and if you're not required to have it, aka dry lease, then you can do part 91. Oh, here we go. Part 91 subpart F is corporate operations, not common carriage. 119 is all the op spec stuff, operation specifications. That'd be like where you need multi more than one crew member, and um, there's all sorts of different like minimums, takeoff minimums, and all that stuff op specs and that would be like all the all the stuff that it says for op specs for part 121 and 135 and uh, it also lists the parts that do not require you to have an operational certificate and then of course 121 125 and 135 are the operational certificate stuff air carrier and operational certificates what limitation is imposed on newly certificated commercial airplane pilot if that person does not hold an instrument rating? Uh, you cannot carry passengers for hire in airplanes and cross-country flights more than 50 nautical miles, and you cannot carry passengers at night. Uh, to act as a required flight crew member, you must have what? A pilot certificate? A photo identification, an appropriate medical certificate, and if required, like a type rating or um, proof of recent experience in your logbook. Certificated pilot changes his or her permit mailing address. They have 30 days 
30 days to submit the new address. If your certificate is lost or destroyed, uh, you can continue to exercise the privileges if you apply for a replacement under Part 61 to the DOT, FAA, or request online to Airman Services. And if you have lost it, you may obtain it in a form or manner approved by the FAA Administrator document conveying temporary authorization. Blah, 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 blah. You can have that for 60 days until you get your duplicate. High performance aircraft. Over 200 horsepower. You must have received and logged ground and flight training from an authorized instructor in a high performance airplane or that is a full flight simulator training device that is representative of such. Been found proficient in the operation and received an endorsement in your logbook from an authorized instructor. A complex aircraft is one that has a retractable landing gear flaps and a controllable pitch propeller. Um, and this includes airplanes that have a engine control system that has a digital computer for controlling engine and propeller. Also known as a FADEC, Full Authority Digital Engine Control. Uh, what are the requirements for that? Similarly to high performance, you must have received in log flight training and uh, received your endorsement that you are proficient. To act as PSC in a pressurized aircraft, uh, which would be an aircraft that has a service ceiling or maximum operating altitude, whichever is lower, above 25,000 feet MSL. A person must have received a log ground and flight training from authorized instructor and obtain an endorsement in the person's logbook or training record from an authorized instructor who certifies that the person has satisfactorily accomplished the ground training, which includes high altitude aerodynamics, meteorology, respiration, hypoxia, etc., 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 and received in log training in a pressurized aircraft or a full flight simulator representative of such. Obtain an endorsement and training record. Blah, 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 blah. Must include normal cruise flight above 25,000 feet. Emergency procedures for rapid decompression and emergency descent procedures. All right. PSE and tailwheel. Similar thing. You must have training and endorsement. When would your commercial pilot require to be holy type rating? Uh, if the aircraft is over 12,500 pounds, if it's turbojet powered, or anything else that the administrator says you must with respect to certification, privileges, limitations. A category is a broad classification of aircraft, like airplane, glider, rotorcraft, lighter than air, etc. Class would be single engine, land, multi-engine land, single engine C, multi-engine C, etc. A specific make and basic model of aircraft, including modifications, do not change Handling or flight characteristics is a type. So so type would be like a Cessna 172. Okay. Question 33. A pilot with commercial certificate, multi-engine land rating, carry passengers in a single engine airplane. No. Because you are not You are not legal for single engine operations. Uh, can a commercial pilot carry passenger in a formation flight? Nope. Can you carry passengers in restricted or limited experimental category? Nope. Uh, commercial pilot. Log flight is second in command. You may only do that when you're qualified. And according to the Second Amendment Command requirements of 14 CFR 61.55, and you occupy a crew member station in an aircraft that requires more than one pilot by the type certificate, or holds the appropriate category, class, and instrument rating if an instrument rating is required for the aircraft being flown, and more than one pilot required under the type of a certification for the aircraft for the regulations under which the flight is being conducted. Basically, basically, you get only a long time if you're re required to be there. And legal to fly it. 
Wow, big shocker there. Currently en route to your destination, and the sun has set. When can you begin logging flight time? Uh, at the end of evening civil twilight. And then you have to stop logging time at the beginning of morning civil twilight. Which is approximately 30 minutes after sunset, give or take a couple, couple of seconds. Pre-flight inspection. An inspector from the FAA introduces herself. Says she wants to conduct a ramp inspection. What documents must you show? Ah. Airman certificate. Medical. Authorization or license. Photo ID. That's about it. Uh, upon a request from any uh, the administrator, authorized NTSB, federal, state, local law enforcement, or authorized representative of the TSA. Cool. Um, currency requirements. Here we go. This is section B. We made it to B from A. We got a long ways left to go. What are the requirements to main current? 24 months, you must have a flight review. To carry passengers, in 90, within 90 days, you must have three takeoffs and landings. A sole manipulator the controls in the same category and class. And if type rating is required, of the same type. If it's a tailwheel aircraft, landings must be made full, full stop. Interesting. Uh, and obviously, if it's conducted in the area between one hour after and one hour before sunrise with passengers, then you must have made three takeoffs and landings to a full stop in the same category and class and type of type is required. Uh, you may do them in a flight simulator, which is whack. Um... Verify that you have it. Blah, 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 blah. Cool. Commercial pilot is not required to log all their time. Only the stuff that is required for training and aeronautical experience to meet the requirement for the certificate rating or flight review. And rice and the recent flight experience requirement, of course. What minimum information is required when you're logging time? You must have the date, the flight time, Location where you arrived and departed. And uh, if it's in a flight simulator, where it occurred. You also must have the type of experience. If it was solo, pilot command, second in command, um, flight training, training in flight simulator, etc., etc. And the conditions. If it was day or night, actual instrument or simulated instrument, or if it was in a flight training device. As a commercial pilot, you get a job flying freight at night. Does your night currency count towards your currency to carry passengers during the day? Yes, of course. Because there's nothing saying for day currency that your landings must be at the day, just that they must occur, which includes at night. As long as they're in the same 90 days of the same category, class, and type, if type is required. Difference between current and being proficient. Well, obviously, being current means you're legal. Being proficient means you're good at it. You could have done three landings three months ago and be terrible at landing. But you'd be legal to. Ah, personal minimums checklist. How will it reduce the list? What well, risk? If you uh, know what you think is safe for you and you know what you think is dangerous, don't do what you think is dangerous. Do what you think is safe. Ta-da. <laughs> uh ha. Unfamiliar aircraft. Unfamiliar avionics. It can increase the risk, because you're not proficient in it. Section C. Well, that was pretty quick. There's only seven questions there. Medical certificates. Ah. 14 CFR Part 67 is medical certificates. You must have a second-class medical certificate to exercise the privileges of a commercial pilot. It lasts for 12 months. Where can you find a list? Uh, the standards are in part 57. There are 15 conditions that are disqualification, disqualifying by history of clinical diagnosis. 
Ah, if you're a flight crew member and you have high blood pressure, you're in possession of a current medical. Can you continue to exercise? No. Because if you have a known medical condition that would make you unable to meet the standards, even if you have met them in the past, you're not allowed to. You should consult an aviation medical examiner before continuing. Can you use medications? Ah, here it says the regulations prohibit pilots from performing crew member duties while taking medication or receiving other treatments for a medical condition that results in the person being unable to meet the requirements for medical certificate necessary for the pilot operation. Basically, safest bet, don't use any medication. If you must, well, look it up. It's probably not allowed. <laughs> yeah, you probably can't even take Advil, to be honest, so... You can take a grand total of, like, one type of air sickness med. That's it. But if you have to take an air sickness med, you probably shouldn't be a pilot. Basic med does not apply to commercial or ATP. Additional questions. These ones don't have answers. You hold a commercial pilot certificate and own an aircraft. Can you rent or lease your aircraft out to your friends and have them employ you as their pilot? No, you cannot. Because that would be holding out. They're not pilots. They can't rent a plane and have you fly it. Because then they'd be having you as the pilot. Which would make it common carriage because you're holding out. And also because you're being the pilot and providing the plane. You'd probably need a certificate of operation. Uh, why is it important? To understand who has operational control if you're a commercial pilot. Because a lot of times when you're flying, you don't have operational control. Your company does, and they have to have an operational certificate. If you have operational control, you have to have a certificate, which is not a fun time. What are the minimum currency for flying under uh, ca carrying passengers and flying under IFR? Uh, I believe that would be the, as long as you are current for being under IFR, and you're current for carrying passengers in the day or at night, you should be good for it. Proficiency check within the preceding 24 months is pa. Oh, yeah, if you've added a rating, you do not have to do a flight review because if you added a rating, that basically counts as a flight review. The 24 months restarts. What maneuvers will you be required to demonstrate during your flight review as a commercial pilot? Ah. Well, required is different than what they could do, I guess. But there's lazy eights. There's eights on pylons. There's steep turns. Stalls, slow flight. Accelerated stalls. Uh, chandelles. I'm losing fingers here. Um, steep spirals. Uh, I mean, they c and they could also do any private pilot maneuver as well. So I guess turns around a point and S-turns. And slow flight, dirty or clean, stalls, dirty or clean. Short field, soft field takeoff and landing. And uh, rejected takeoff procedures. Basically anything. <laughs> Let's see. High altitude endorsement. I don't know anything about that. Instrument rated. Recency experience. Oh, I don't want to answer this one. It's annoying. Uh, in the six months, you have to have receipt, uh, pra tracked and logged. No. Intercepted and tracked a course. Uh, done th six approaches. Something like that. Hold on. Let's see. See, I've got an iPad. <laughs> Gonna pull up four flight. Logbook. IFR. I have 39 days remaining. Aha. Six approaches, one hold. That's what it is. Six approaches, one hold, and you have to intercept and track a course. See? Yay. Okay. Ah. <laughs> All right. Airworthiness requirements number two. Number two. Chapter two. Let's go. What time is it? Time to have some fun. Oh, it's like nine o'clock. Wow, that's cray cray. Okay, this one better be quick. 
You must have an airworthiness certificate, registration, radio station license if you're outside the United States. You must have a your your uh, POH markings and play cards, everything like that, weight and balance, compass deviation card, serial number, all that good stuff. What is your airworthiness certificate? It's what is it? Uh, it's what's issued by the administrator. For each aircraft, civil aircraft, to say it is airworthy. It's basically like saying you're legal. And then you have to maintain it by getting annual inspections. Or 100-hour inspections for commercial operations. Ah, if the airworthiness certificate runs out... Oh, hold on. If it, if it indicates one of the following categories, what significance does this have? Normal category is uh, 3.8 Gs, non aerobatic operation. Utility category is 4.4 Gs, which means you can do certain stuff like spins. Um, pretty much for commercial operations, you're only going to have normal category. But if you're special, you get utility category. Like training planes usually have utility category. Does an airworthiness certificate have an expiration date? No, but you must upkeep it. Where is it located? It must be displayed at the cockpit entrance so you can see it to passengers and crew. Um, for the aircraft to be considered airworthy, it must conform to its type design, and it must be in a safe operating condition. How can you determine that? Well... You have to look through the logbooks and ensure that all the logbook entries are up to date. Maintenance is done. And do a pre-flight inspection to include uh, wear and deterioration, structural damage, fluid leaks, tire wear, and operative instruments, blah, 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 broken stuff. Who is responsible for it? Well, the owner or the operator is responsible for ensuring that it is in safe operating condition. However, specific to the flight, the pilot in command is responsible to making to ensure that the flight safety. But the person responsible for upkeep and fixing is the operator, owner or operator. Airworthiness directives are a notice put up by the FAA that is mandatory that certain things must be fixed on aircraft because they're dangerous. There are two types. There are the emergency kind and there's the less urgent that that must be done within a specific period of time. There's also recurring ones, like for a lot of Piper aircraft with their wing spars. It's like it just keeps coming around and around and around. And one of these days, eventually, you're going to have a crack in your wing spar, and you're going to be out 30 grand. But you know that is what it is. When are the emergency ADs issued? That's when, like, all of a sudden, they're like, ah, this could blow up. That's not good. And, um... Then they say, everybody shut down your operations and fix this. While re reviewing the aircraft logbooks, you discover the aircraft is not in compliance with the ADs. Tisk, tisk. Can you continue to operate? No. You cannot. Uh, special Airworthiness Information Bulletins, also known as SAIB. It's a non-regulatory information, guys. Basically, it's like AD's light edition. You don't have to comply with them, but it's a good idea, too. Uh, type certificate data sheet. That is, uh, when you put... When uh, there's new aircraft engine, propeller, etc. New stuff. And... The FAA finds out that it's safe, and it says, all right, you can use this under these specific conditions and limitations. Supplemental type. Statute of limitations. No, not that one. What about an STC? Do you know about those? Sexually transmitted crabs. No, that is not the one. <laughs> A supplemental type certificate. Basically, it's saying, Close hey. enough. You can change this if you do it in this specific way, like putting a GoPro mount on the outside of your airplane. 
There's probably an STC for that. There's also an STC for using like car gas in your airplane. And they're like, ah, well, if you make these modifications to your airplane, you can safely use car gas. I mean, let me just land in the middle of the road and stop at this Irving. They actually do that in like Utah, Idaho. Well, that's because it's Utah. <laughs> They just they just like land next to the highway, taxi on up to the gas station by the truckers, and be like, "What's up, man?" <laughs> and Alaska, of course, the final frontier. Nobody lives there. That's why. Uh, registration. The government wants your money, so give them money, and they'll let you have a little sticker. License and registration. It expires three years after the last day of the month in which it was issued, and you can get a wow, temporary that's a long time. one for only ninety days. Information on the placards. It'll be in the TCDS. Placards. Basically, it's going to be in your in the <coughs> aircraft information manual saying, "Hey, this is should be there. This this should say, don't do this right on this spot because that's where you look and you say, huh, I shouldn't do that. Like where no, it says, should. avoid slips with flaps extended right under the flaps." But, like, half of them don't say it. And you just do it anyways because it says avoid, not prohibited. <laughs> There's a difference. See? <laughs> it just says avoid, which means you can do it. You're just not supposed exactly. to. Exactly. Uh, airplane flight manuals required to be on board the aircraft at all times. No. False. Yes. Aircraft maintenance requirements in Section B here. We're finally, we're finally to Section B. Of chapter two. B for boys. Wow. I like those. No, wait, what? <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> Who said that? Carlos, uh... are you in here? <laughs> Josh, is that you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what are the oh, required? No, no. Ah, here. This is a fun part. Here, what are the required tests and inspections? You must have your annual inspection in 12 months. Airworthiness directives complied with. VOR check every 30 days. Your 100-hour inspection. Your altimeter and pedostatic system every 24 calendar months. Your transponder every 24 calendar months. And your ELT every 12 months or one cumulative hour of use or 50% of the useful battery life. Ooh. All aircraft must have an annual inspection. All aircraft under 12.5, uh, except for turbine aircraft that are used for hire, uh, must have a 100-hour inspection. Uh, yes, military. Anything for instruction or hire must, must have 100-hour inspections, essentially. Unless it's a turbine aircraft. In which case... I don't know what they do, but they don't inspect them every 100 hours because they're special. They're they're like, ah, spinny boy engines. They can go longer without maintenance. Yeah, that's fine. If an aircraft is operated for hire, is it required to have a 100-hour inspection as well as an annual inspection? Yes, it is. No. If it's been on schedule... Of every 100 hours. What condition may it continue to operate beyond the 100 hours without new inspection? You can you can, cannot exceed it by more than 10 hours. Hippity and that's only when you're en route to a place where the inspection can be done. If the annual inspection date has passed, can an aircraft be operated to a location where the inspection can be performed? Nope. Yes, it's a special flight permit. Where My they're like, tells me I'm special. They're like, all right, I know you you done goofed, but you can still fly it because you got to get it fixed. Just like my car. Yeah, yeah, it's illegal, but you got to drive it, so it's okay. Mm, very. The engine logbook. Aha! Here we go. You notice the engine has exceeded its TBO. Time between Ooh, overhaul. I like this car. Uh, 
TBO times are make and model specific and the recommended overhaul times are usually identified in the engine manager's service bulletin or letter. For nine, part 91 operations, not mandatory. You don't have to get your engine overhauled. Probably a good idea too, but you don't have to. But if you're idea. doing it for part 121 or 135, you must. Special flight permits. I'll only like it more if I can bag it. Bag it and tag it? Yes. Uh, okay, special flight permits. is flying it's to legal. the repairs, delivering or exporting product new new production, flight testing, evacuating it from an impeding <clears throat> danger, or conducting customer demonstration flights. How are they obtained? Well, you must <clears throat> go to the local FISDO. Flight Safety District Office. Sounds illegal. Or designated airworthiness representative. No, it's very legal. Legal Eagle. Like Schmeagel. Chapter 2, Section B, Question 10. That made me feel uncomfortable. Yeah. We have a second person watching now, other than just you, Jeffrey. Oh, really? We do. Oh, hello, other person. Hello, other person. Hi, this is my face. Oh. Yes, now I'm going to hide it behind a book again. <laughs> After aircraft inspections have been made and defects have been repaired, who is responsible for determining that the aircraft is in airworthy condition? That would be the pilot in command. Uh, what regulations apply concerning the operation of an aircraft that has had alterations or repairs that might substantially affect its operation? Well, I believe that no person may operate or carry passengers. Um, unless it has been flown for a operational check of the maintenance performed, and it must be logged in the maintenance, uh, well, in the aircraft records, yes. Can you fly with known inoperative equipment on board? Yes. I'm going to say no. Yes, you can. There's a lot of things that can be broken, and you can still fly, actually. You can have, like, half your screws missing, and you can still fly. <laughs> That's concerning. Yeah, but they're not important screws, you know? So you're good. That's still concerning. And you know what? You know what's even funnier? Is uh, if important uh, things like your radio are broken, right? You can still fly as long as you put a piece of tape over the radio that says broken. <laughs> That's very concerning. But if you don't, if you don't, put a piece of tape over it that says inoperative, right? Illegal. Illegal. You can't fly with it broken unless it says it's broken. But if it says it's broken, fine. It's fine. It's okay. It could be broken. That's very concerning. Yep. Ooh, okay. Unfamiliar. Unfamiliarity with 14 CFR 91 to 213 is common weakness for applicants at all levels. Ooh, a Sabaru. So basically, they're going to ask a question on this. Part 91 describes acceptable method for the operation of aircraft with certain inoperative instruments and equipment that are not essential for safe flight. Ah, minimum equipment list. Cool. Limitations apply to aircraft operation under the defense Feral provision. What? Feral. A feral. Just like a feral cat. Uh, the decision should be to cancel the flight, obtain maintenance prior to the flight, or defer the item or equipment. Maintenance deferrals are not used for in flight. Hello, Mars. Oh, said it'll be right back. Okay. Oh, hi, Mars. Sorry, I wasn't looking at comments. I was reading book. Wow, what a scrub. Big book. You a I scrub. I am this far through. During the pre-flight inspection, an aircraft that does not have a minimum equipment list, you notice an instrument or equipment item is inoperative. How can you determine if it's still airworthy? Well, it's probably in the POH, the Pilot Operating Handbook. You just got to make sure there's a sticker over it that says inoperable. Well, first you have to make sure that it says it's okay that you can fly it with inoperable. And then you put the sticker over it that says inoperable. Then you're good. 
Nah, just throw the sticker over and you're good. Uh, are they part of the day t- VFR day type certification? It's basically like stuff that's required for you to fly in the day. Um, Perhaps. If it's not, it's like if you, you don't, you don't technically, legally, you don't need a radio. Depending on the airspace you're going to be in. But um, as long as you're not going okay, to like towered airports. The well, you can't do that because there they require radio and they require you to go through special training and stuff and be on a flight plan to a destination. But they don't require it if they don't know you're there. But they will know you're there. That's the thing. They have these things called helicopters. I'm invisible. And they have these other things called missiles. <laughs> if I if I cover my eyes, I can't see them. Therefore, they can't see me. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. I I would not recommend that though. Flying blind. Have you seen um, American Made the movie? I have not. You need to. It's about the Iran Contra affair. Interesting. Uh, but basically, it's about this guy smuggling drugs across the southern border, based on a true story. Is this why you're uh, getting your pilot's license, Daniel? No. Hashtag exposed. <laughs> Caught in Caught 4K. 4K. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, who goest thou there? Hi, Carla. Ah, it do be Carla. Do be, do be, do. I can't do that. It's copyrighted. I did like three chapters. So I'm done. I am. I'm going through chapter two right now. I think I'm going to finish that, and then we're, we're going to watch anime. I think I'm okay, going to change the read, title of this to not include chapter three. I read three chapters today, so I'm good. Very nice. Namaste. Okay. Are really. they required? Are the inoperative instruments or equipments? Um. Blah 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 blah. blah. Uh, is there an AD? Cool. Yeah, Here we go. This is AD. this is the part I was telling you about, Jeffrey. Uh, if the if the answer is no to all these questions, then the inoperative equipment must be removed by an aircraft and power plant me- mechanic, airframe and power plant mechanic, or be deactivated and placarded inoperative. Which basically <laughs> means. Pull the circuit breaker out, put a zip tie around it so they can't push it back in, and then put a piece of tape across it that says, inoperative. And then you're good. Oh, no. Much concern. Yep. Oh, no. Exam tip. If an instrument or equipment item is inoperative in your aircraft, please be able to explain how you'll determine if it's airworthy and legal for flight. Yeah, I hope nothing's broken the day of the check ride. That would stink. I've got two pages left. Yeah, what if you? What if you? What What if the plane is not able to be flown because something's broken? <laughs> then, well... That would have been a flight illegal, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it would be a pretty bad day. I would have... Yeah, that'll be a very, very bad day. When you're not ready for your check ride, so you just break one of the flaps off. <laughs> Oops! Is hey, that an incident or is that an accident? It's called sabotage. <laughs> it was an accident. That incident was accidental. Oops, I leaned on the airplane the wrong way and broke it. Guess we can't fly. <laughs> Ooh, a kinds of operation equipment list identifies systems and equipment and certification for each thing. Cool. Basically, a list of what it, if what it's required for. So, if it's broken, you can be like, ah, this is required for everything. We can't fly. Or ah, this is only required for instrument and night flight. So we can't do those, but we can fly in the day. VFR. Minimum equipment list. That's everything that's required minimally. You can't do that. That's copyrighted. Ah, no. <laughs> They're going to take you down. Okay. Uh, limitations that apply to operations being inducted with the MEL. There's probably some sort of letter of authorization thing. The FAA will reg- will issue for you to have one for operational stuff, um, especially if there's an STC. 
Cool. What do you need for VFR flight in the day? You must have anti-collision lights. You must have a tachometer for every engine that you have. You must have oil pressure gauges for every engine that you have. You must have a manifold pressure gauge for every engine that you have. Oh. You must have an altimeter. Temperature gauge for liquid-cooled engines. Oil temperature gauge for air-cooled engines. Fuel no. gauge for each tank. Flotation gear if you're going off beyond power off gliding distance um, for higher. Landing no. gear position if you have retractable gear. Uh, airspeed indicator. Magnetic direction indicator. A.K.A. Wire. a compass. And you must have an ELT and safety belts, which are required to be used after 1978. Actually, technically, uh, shoulder harnesses for each front seat in an aircraft manufactured after 1978. So, you know, back seats, nah. Who needs those? Who goest thou there now? Now we Joshua. have Joshua. Hi, Josh. How are you today, sir? All right, last question, last question. Here it comes. What instruments and equipment are required for VFR night flight? A trumpet. Um, you must have one spare set or three fuses of each kind required. That's interesting. I didn't know that. No one ever I told me this. A trumpet. Huh. What? You must have one spare set or three fuses of each kind. Required, accessible to the pilot in flight. Maybe that's only for fuses, though. I guess for breakers, you don't really need those. Breaker, breaker. Although, for planes with fuses, you must have them. Uh, you must have a landing light, if it's for hire. But if it's not for hire, you don't need a landing light. Uh, Anti-collision light system. Position lights. And electrical energy. Basically, Solar a panels. generator, generator or alternator. Solar panels. Or battery, I guess technically. It just says source of electrical energy. Okay, let me attach a wind turbine. Technically, I think that would satisfy. In fact, large aircraft do have backup uh, generators for when the systems fail. Like if you have all engines breaking. You can just like flip down this thing. It comes out the bottom of the plane, and it's just ram air pressure spinning a turbine, and it gives you power. That's what the big jets have. Forced induction. Not really, but close. Points for trying. Just call it what it is. It's forced induction. There was no consent given there. There probably the was not. not consent. Okay, I'm gonna end this now. Goodbye. Me too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Bye. Bye.